Nice and warm in here, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm a bit late. Just been uh, doing a bit of a meeting. Um, okay. So today is the last day of practice, or full day of practice for the retreat. And for today, I would like to uh, introduce the theme of impermanence. And on the first day of practice, I emphasized the idea of uh, mindfulness, awareness of the body. Second day, I mentioned the idea of bringing into joy into practice. And now I'm introducing the idea of impermanence. Actually, each one of these should be like a, a week or a year or something like that. But anyway, <laughs> we're doing it. Everyone tells me New York's such a fast-paced city, so presumably that's how we do it. So we're doing impermanence here. Fine. And you see, the thing is that when people are doing retreats, that they... You know, they'll be sitting there contemplating, oh, this is impermanent and that's impermanent and so on. And they don't realize that what matters is that the retreat is impermanent, actually. See, it's like we, we, we take these kind of ideas and we, 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 treat, we treat them in a way that, um, like I think a lot of the time in Buddhist practice, we treat things in a way that sort of we, we, we can kind of wrap them up and make them safe. We wrap them up in words and doctrines, and we think that, that we kind of understand it. Ah, oh, that's impermanent. It's like it, it, so. It's almost this this thing that's almost uh, it's almost impossible to avoid doing it. So, f for example, like when the the Buddha taught his first sermon, right, the Dhammachakapavatana Sutta, and he taught the Four Noble Truths. He taught suffering, the origin of suffering, the ending of suffering, and the path leading to the ending of suffering. And when he taught that discourse, uh, uh, the monk Venerable Kandanya became enlightened. He became a stream enterer. And most of us have heard that so many times, right? <laughs> and we still haven't got it, right? And so there's something about there's something about we say, oh yeah, we know the four noble truths. Oh yeah, and then when the four noble truths come up, we're like, oh yeah, whatever, heard that one before, <laughs> right? And so there's always this thing. You always have to. You always have to try to make make things become real. And and things things turn into just like a punchline, right? And this, you even see this in the, in the in the Buddhist scriptures themselves. You know, a great example is something like the Vimalakirti Nidesha, the Mahayana Sutra, one of my favourite sutras because it's got the the world's first knock knock joke. Okay. <laughs> And, and Sariputta comes up to, there's a great bodhisattva, Vimalakirti, who's, who's sort of sent out this kind of, he's using his skillful means to prove that all of the, ar the arahants don't really understand the Dhamma very well. And he sends out word that he's sick. He's not really sick, but of course all sentient beings are suffering, so he's sick in that kind of sense. And so Sariputta comes to his house, and bas I mean this is paraphrasing, but basically like he knocks on the door, you know, knock, knock, who, you know, who's there, nobody's home. And then Sariputta says, nobody's here. And Sariputta says, what do you mean nobody's here? I can hear you answering. Right? <laughs> yeah, so nobody's here in the ultimate sense, right? Because all dhammas are empty, right? So if you're looking for a person here, then there's one, right? <laughs> so this is, this, is, this is a Buddhist knock-knock joke, right? And... And you have to do, see the thing is you have to do that because the, the teachings become stale. And this is what a lot of the kind of stuff you find in the, the Mahayana teachings is what they do is they turn everything upside down because then it challenges you to think in things a different way. Right? Otherwise it just everything just becomes locked and become rigid and hard. And that doesn't that's just it's just you, you don't get any insight from that. All you do is get correct. You get marks ticked off in an exam. Yes, you know the answer to the Dhamma questions. Congratulations. <laughs> right? I mean, it's better than not knowing the answers, right? It's, it's fine, right? It's good to know the answers, right? But it's not wisdom. Yeah? It's just knowledge. Yeah? 
So this is our challenge when we come to retreat is, okay, we know these things, right? We know there's, there's, there's suffering, right? We know that there's impermanence. We know these things, right? But how do you actually realize them? How do you see them? How do you make them matter? That's the problem. How do you make them matter? What does impermanence mean, right? Does impermanence mean that there's a thought here and then it's gone? Okay, fine, that's impermanence. But impermanence also means things that actually matter, right? In, in my home state, New South Wales, at the moment, it's on fire. There's fires everywhere. People are dying. Home, hundreds of homes are being burnt. Yeah? That's impermanence. Yeah? And that's not something that you can just look at and say, oh, oh yes, it is impermanent. <laughs> it matters. Yeah? It matters. And so impermanence is, shouldn't be a way that we can just kind of wrap things up and dismiss them. And you, I hear people doing this in Buddhism all the time, you know, even when you talk about climate change and these kinds of things. It's like, oh yes, well, the world's always been impermanent, right? It's just change. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and like millions of people are going to die. And you can't just look at that and say, oh yes, it's impermanent. Right? I mean, you're not wrong, right? But you're certainly not right either. Right? So, so on retreat, and when we get that chance in a meditation, we get the chance to actually look in and try to cut through these kinds of conceptualizings and things. These, these are like, these are like, uh, these are all techniques of denial. These are all techniques that can wrap up our own delusion and our own conceit and convince ourselves that we know and that we understand without us having to really face the hard questions. Because the, the moment that you really see impermanence will be shocking. And it will be terrifying. Yeah? And, and it's like the world drops away. And you know, this is everything that I've ever known. It's not just this thing that's impermanent, but everything I've ever known has been impermanent. That's all I've known. In fact, all I've known is impermanence. And the world suddenly seems, it just changed. And everything you see is broken. And it's one of the great similes that Ajahn Chah would talk about with impermanence. And it's people would ask him, what does impermanence mean? He said, this glass, he says, it's broken already. Uh, impermanence is not waiting around for things to rise and fall. It's seeing that impermanence is, the, is the, actually the nature of things all the time. And so to be able to see through and to be able to see that reality and to be able to see the truth of things in the meditation, this is really what it's about. And this is why we prepare ourselves by doing all the mindfulness practices. It's why we prepare ourselves by uh, uh, stilling our mind through, through samadhi meditation and getting that clarity of mind. And a lot of it has to do with, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, getting our minds into a, a state and into a condition where they are ready to just look truth in the face and say, hello truth, how are you going? <laughs> Without being too freaked out by it. Because if you, if you look, you know, like the classic Nietzsche saying, if you look into, stare into the abyss long enough, it stares back at you. <laughs> yeah. right. Right? And so this is what it's like. So this is why we do a lot of metta practice. It's like we emphasize a lot of joy and you make your mind still. And, and once you've done that, and once you know how to find that stillness and that peace inside of yourself, then you have that. No one can take it away from you. You know that that peace is something that you can find inside yourself. And then that gives you a confidence to be able to say, well, look, now I can look at all of these things. I don't need the, the, the goggles, I don't need the visors, I don't need to hide from it. I don't need to twist it or deny it. This is what the world is like. And the world ultimately is neither good nor bad. You know? it's, not, it's not, from most, most religious point of view, see when people talk about Buddhism and other religions, they tend to focus on very kind of surface things. They say, oh, you know, you know other religions have a savior, and Buddhism doesn't have a savior. To me, these things are really, on the surface. The real difference is that Buddhism doesn't see creation 
as something which is inherently good. It just is. Yeah? From a theistic point of view, creation is good because God made it. And this is where you get the whole problem with the problem of evil, right? Because cr God created it, it's good, but then, you know, there's babies dying of AIDS. You know? And so you're like, actually, is that good? So from a Buddhist point of view, creation isn't good or bad, it just is. That's all. It's just where we are. And as long as that's here, as long as, the, as, long as creation is happening and samsara is happening, it has these qualities, the qualities of impermanence, anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanent suffering and not self. That's just how it is. And so we look inside ourselves and we see those things inside ourselves. Now, one of the problems with contemplating impermanence and one of the great delusions of it is that we can see impermanence. You can't see impermanence. You can't see change. See? We're watching Dave walk across the room. What are we seeing? Are we seeing change? Are we seeing movement? No, you're just seeing light, actually. You don't see change. Change is not something you can actually see. We think we can see, but that's because we're deluded. Yeah. So the world is a bit like you know, kind of like a movie or something like that. You have these different frames, and it looks like it's moving, but actually it's just an illusion created in your brain. I'm not saying that the world is made up of individual frames like a movie's made up. I'm just saying that that same process is that we're creating these things in our minds. <coughs> so in fact, change or impermanence is something we infer. We don't see. What you see is something's like this, something's like that. And in your mind, you make a connection between them and you say, oh, this has changed from this state to that state. But that's our un understanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when your mindfulness is very fast and your mindfulness is very sharp, you start to see this. And what, what starts to happen is that the connections between things start to dissolve. Right. And uh, again, just as a metaphor, and again, don't take this too literally, but just as a metaphor, imagine you're, you're watching a movie. Now, if, you, if you're watching a movie and you slow down the projector rate, then ultimately you'll reach a point where you can see each individual frame. Right? But imagine that you don't slow down the projector rate, but you speed up your mind. The same thing would happen. If your mind gets sharp enough, you can actually see each individual frame. So this is what's happening in meditation. Your mind is becoming sharp enough so that you can see all of these things happening. And you can start to decon... The, the connections between them start to dissolve. And at a certain point in your meditation, everything will like... Everything sort of becomes like a castle of sand. You know, it's like the whole kind of world's like these castles of sand. And you build these sand castles, and we, we could have glued them together with the wet sand, but then the tide goes out, they dry out, and they just crumble down. And it's just sand. And the connection, you realize that, that, that this is just this, this fantasy that we're living in, this something that we've lived in, we've, we've constructed in our mind. I'm not, I'm not again, I'm, please don't over overinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not speaking too literally and I'm not trying to give you a, a philosophy of how the world is or anything like that. I'm just trying to, to express something of the kinds of things that we start to experience when the insight starts to deepen in meditation. We start to see the world breaking down like it's castles of sand. And of course when we see that, right? It, it can be very frightening. You know, it can be quite terrifying. You know? And that's okay. You know? It's quite good, actually. Yeah? It's not that we want you to be scared. We just don't mind it all that much. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's part of growth. right? And there will come a time in your meditation 
But uh, 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 I'll, I'll tell you this quite honestly. I sat around. I teach. I teach um, in Sydney. I teach a course called uh, Buddhism and Psychotherapy together with a, a group of uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and you know Buddhist practitioners of various backgrounds and so on. And there was maybe twenty of us or something. The teachers sitting in a room talking about these things. And somebody, and so we were talking about uh, how people can go crazy when you're on meditation retreats. And every single one of the people there had been through some time when they thought they were going crazy on a retreat. <laughs> right? So this is kind of interesting. So it's a, it's a difficult point. It's not one that we necessarily understand or deal with all that well. It is possible for people to have psychotic breaks and things on retreats, not that uncommon. On a retreat like this, it's okay because it's fairly short and not too intensive. But on longer and more intensive retreats, it really does happen. But also what happens is that you feel like you're going crazy. And when you feel like you're going crazy, what's happening is that the the... The, 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 the received knowledge that you thought you knew is dissolving. Yeah. All, all the categories and the ideas and the thoughts of your place in the world, everything you thought about how the world is, falls apart. And then you're like, <laughs> I feel like I'm going crazy. And usually, you'll get better, hopefully. Uh, if, and again, I'm, I'm not saying this is a kind of an immediate thing because uh, I've spoken to everyone on the interviews. I don't think any of you are going crazy and it's a nice short retreat, so I think it's fine. But if you're on a longer retreat or if you're with people or something like this and this looks ha it does look like it's happening, it does happen, make sure you go and speak to the teachers and get some help right? if you really think that there's a problem. The worst thing that I'll say to you is, no, you're not going crazy. Right? But if you are or you're someone you know is, then they, they can help. So if you're meditating and everything's starting to fall apart, nothing makes sense anymore, right? You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, don't want to eat food. Why? Food is just sankharas. It's just conditions. This is just conditions. Why should I bother, right? Everything look. Everything becomes the same. It's this very, you're in this, this kind of very weird state where like literally everything is the same, and. Uh, so it's uh, you know you can like well I could sit here I could walk out in the cold and I can feel that cold sensation it's just another sensation what's the difference between feeling warm in here and feeling cold out there it's just a sensation and so you go through these kind of stages where and like all of your kind of values and all of the sense of meaning and so on starts to break down and so this is this is what's happening as that insight is going on now these these are all this is all kind of part of a path of development. And so the reason that I'm talking about this, and as when I was talking about earlier, then you know, maybe none of this will happen to you. That's fine. This is a long and complicated road, so don't expect anything. Maybe it will happen. Maybe something will happen that's quite different from what I'm talking about. That also is okay. My point here is that in our path, and especially as our meditation deepens, we will reach points where our mind opens up in ways that it hasn't opened up before, and we won't know what's going on. Normally, what will happen is that the mind, you'll keep on going and the mind will gradually sort itself out, right? Uh, and so it will, it will learn to integrate that kind of new experience and that new understanding. That's the way that it should happen. So for today's retreat, I want you to <coughs> keep, keep practicing as you've been doing. I don't want you to necessarily do anything that's very different, any kind of meditation you been doing that's fine if you like the meta meditation we did yesterday and you want to do some more of that that's great uh, but if you just want to keep doing whatever you've been doing that's fine but also just bring into that and ask yourself what is there that's impermanent about this experience and somebody once asked Ajahn Chah what's the difference between Samatha and Vipassana and so if you've hung around in Theravadan meditation circles at all, you'll know this is something that we really love to argue about, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's weird, right? I find it so weird, we're sort of people arguing about Samatha. So, so Samatha is tranquility, 
And up until now, most of what I've been emphasizing is that aspect of tranquility. But from today, I'm emphasizing more on the vipassana side, right? So, you know, you have whole schools where we do vipassana, no summit are allowed here, right? Oh, and so weird. Anyway, they asked, someone asked Ajahn Chah, what's the difference between samatha and vipassana? He said, well, they're completely different. He said, samatha meditation is like this. You sit down cross-legged, you place your hands on your lap, you close your eyes and you watch your breath and you make your mind peaceful. Vipassana is completely different. Vipassana, you sit down cross-legged, you place your hands on your lap, close your eyes, you watch your breath, you make your mind peaceful and you know this is not a sure thing. <laughs> huh? So don't think about samatha and vipassana as being two com different kinds of meditation. right? So when we call meditation, samatha meditation or vipassana meditation, it's really a misnomer. The Buddha didn't use language in that way. For the Buddha, samatha and vipassana were qualities of the mind which you develop through meditation. Samatha is the tranquility you develop in meditation. Vipassana is the insight you develop in meditation. Now, certain kinds of meditation methods are geared towards primarily developing one or other of these sets of qualities. Right? So metta meditation, for example, is mostly orientated towards developing qualities on the samatha side. Right? So this is why they call it the samatha meditation. If I sit there and I note the rise and fall of different phenomena in my body, then this is mostly geared towards uh, uh, developing insight. And so we call that a vipassana meditation. But when you sit down there and you note various things, this is not vipassana. Right? It's just a meditation method. The vipassana is the actual insight that you will hopefully gain through that. Don't mistake the method for the thing. Right? So what I'm uh, suggesting to you today is that uh, to, to rather than saying, well, like, I'm going to stop doing samatha, I'm going to start doing vipassana, you keep doing the same meditation that you're doing, but then you just ask yourself, what, what is, is this permanent? Look at it, look at how, how, how it changes. Reflect back on it. And this is something which you can integrate into your practice all the time. Uh, for example, when I did the metta meditation last night, you may have noticed that when we finished the metta meditation, one of the things that we did was that we consciously allowed the feeling of metta to come to an end before the meditation did. Right? And see, a lot of people don't like this. A lot of people are like, can I just keep it going? And then I just keep the metta going and I can get up and like metta at everybody. Right? <laughs> yeah. So this is part of the practice. You let it go, and then you watch it end. And that mind that wants it to keep going, of course, this is your attachment. Right? So you watch it end. Actually, metta is beautiful. It's so lovely to feel that, right? But it's still impermanent. And so you watch that. Oh, okay. Your mind. It's just a feeling. It's very beautiful, very powerful, very, very, uh, 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 very uh, beneficial feeling. But it's just a feeling. So you let it go. So you can bring this into your meditation during the day. And if you feel like, like sometimes you like feel like that, that this kind of insight is really taking off. right? So you feel like you, you look at something and your mind really sees that impermanence, like it latches onto it. Okay? So if you feel like your mind is eager to pursue that contemplation of impermanence, then just follow that. Okay? See, how, see where, where it will take you. In t speaking about vipassana right now, I've been speaking mostly about the aspect of impermanence because this is the one which is the most, it was what's the one that's been the basis of my own insight practice, but it's also the one which I think is the most straightforward to get a, ho a handle on. Uh, but if another kind of, a there's plenty of avenues, plenty of ways of getting into insight. So if another way is suitable for you or interesting for you, then you follow that. Yeah? It's just a matter of different personalities. If that doesn't happen, and if you feel like your mind just wants to be still and wants to be peaceful, then just do that. All right? Because like, it's, only, it's only a few days retreat. We haven't really, none of us have had the chance to really develop that really deeply. So if you just want to keep on developing your, your tranquility and become more peaceful, fine, just do that. Okay? Um, 
But if you can open it up and start to look a bit on the inside side, then that would be, that would, might be fun. Maybe you'll see something. Maybe you'll blow the world up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Enough for now. <laughs>